Hello and welcome to South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. We often hear national stories about the Farm Bill, immigration reform, and other issues that affect South Carolina's farmers and consumers. But we rarely see the faces of those farmers. We hope to change that over the next 30 minutes as we tour across South Carolina and introduce you to some hardworking family farmers. We'll take you to a wholesale commercial nursery operation introduce you to a couple of peach farmers in South Carolina, one very national large organization and another smaller roadside operation, and then we'll tour the foothills of the mountains of the Blue Ridge and introduce you to farmers in that neck of the woods. All that and more is coming up in just a moment as Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture continues. South Carolina Farm Bureau member benefits are like money in the bank consider these options. Whether you're feeding cattle, milking cows, or baling hay, the work on your farm is never done, which is why you need equipment that works as hard as you do. Get the efficiency and versatility you need with Case IH. From Farmall compact and utility tractors to balers and mowers, all Case IH equipment is designed with one thing in mind, getting the job done. Welcome back to South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. Agricultural news has been especially heavy this year with stories of farmers not being able to hire enough laborers to harvest their crops. And that's true. Farm labor is hard to find. It can be extremely physical work, often in the most adverse weather conditions. And while there's a great need for immigration law reform, and some South Carolina farmers still find it hard to hire enough workers to bring in the harvest, most have found ways to meet their employment needs, often only after making a large investment to comply with a federal government program. Take Titan Farms along South Carolina's Peach Growing Ridge area, for example. Chalmers Carr is the owner-operator of the 5,000-acre peach, bell pepper, and broccoli farm. Labor is our number one input expense by far. 40% of our cost of production is labor, and without labor we could not harvest these crops. You cannot thin, harvest, pack peaches without manually having hands. There's no machinery that can do this. Same thing with bell pepper or broccoli. So having hand harvested labor is the most important thing to us. For the past 15 years or so, Titan Farms has participated in the federal government's H-2A program, a visa program allowing foreign nationals legal entry into the United States for temporary or seasonal agricultural work. Titan Farms hires about 520 immigrant workers in the peak of its peach season each year. But the H-2A program comes at a cost. One of the first requirements of the H-2A law is that the farm must make an active effort to first recruit U.S. workers for those jobs. Then the farmer must pay his workers a wage higher than minimum wage, a wage set by Congress. The farmer must pay transportation costs for the workers to come to and from his farm. And he must provide housing for them while they're on the payroll. What's more, the law only allows for temporary workers. It does not provide a labor force year-round. The H-2A program is a legal way of getting foreign workers to come in and work for operations in the U.S. We have to prove that we have a labor shortage, that they're not U.S. workers able to do the jobs that we have. Then we go through a certification process, the application process to get the workers over here. That can take 45 to 60 days. We put in our application, we go through all the interview process, we get the workers here. Hopefully there's no hiccups along the way. We've been doing this for about 15 years, so we finally got it down a little bit, but it's still always very laborious to get the workers here. Chalmers Carr is active in several agricultural associations, including Farm Bureau. 
He personally works with Congress to craft reasonable immigration reform. And he has an answer to those who want to delay immigration reform until tougher border security is addressed. If you're worried about a secure border issue, that's more people that are coming in here wanting to do harm than these guest workers that are wanting to come in here, work, provide for their families, and go back home. As I said, I've been in this program for 15 years. I have a 90% return rate for my workers. They come in every year, they provide for their families, they're, they're sending over 75% of their check home every week to support their families back home. And trust me, when the season's over, they're ready to go back home and see their families. But the next year, they're ready to come back and provide for them and work with my company. And it's benefited both of us very well. Like the other farmers we'll meet later in the program, Carr understands the human relations side of employment and provides special benefits for his foreign workers. Every evening, but especially on Saturday and Sundays, we're not working. We have Wi-Fi set up on the whole farm, and you'd be surprised of their computer skills. They, they're much better. By, they're Skyping their families back home. They're communicating with their families. So that's the one thing. You've got to understand, they have left their foreign country to come here and work for us. The other thing is, is you've got to make them feel comfortable with the standards of what's different. This is not, some of these people come from towns that have one phone in them. So when they come here, you go on my farm, 400 of them are going to have cell phones on them at all times. So, but getting them to town and getting them acclimated to this area is part of it. We also offer English um, classes for them to start adjusting and to be able to better communicate. So we do some stuff like that that we wouldn't do for an American worker. Again, we don't have American workers, so that's not really an issue there. Titan Farms ships its produce across the country, from South Carolina as far west as Colorado, down to Texas, up to Maine, and down to Florida. On a much smaller scale in the Piedmont region of South Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountain foothills is Fisher Peach Orchards, a 175-acre fourth-generation family peach orchard and roadside market operation. Even with an operation much smaller than Titan Farms, Carol Fisher says she still relies on the government's H-2A program to fully staff her operation. We use the H-2A process that the government offers to us and we've got like uh, three or four um, uh, Hispanics that have been with us. One gentleman has been with us over 20 years, one's been with us over 15. And they live with us year round. They do our pruning in the winter time and uh, then they also join in with the H-2A workers when they come and they pick with them. So they, they're basically not really full time because they can, they can go around uh, wherever they, else they need to fill in work. But now the H-2A boys, they come in uh, usually in March to April and they stay with us about five months and they do the picking and then they go back home to Mexico. This is our fifth year and the majority, we, we have 10, nine to 10 is all that we use. Um, most of them, I think this year I have got um, eight, I've got seven that have been with me the whole entire time. From the first time they've been, they keep returning every year. So they must, they must like working for Fisher's Let's Orchard. Right. Yeah. Ms. Fisher also employs as many local folks as she can, including area high school students. And we hire mainly students, college students, high school students that run our retail stores for us. We've got a retail store at this location and then we've got a, a retail store down at 504 South Buncombe. And then we have a pick your own stand that we have at the house, which was the original that we started with. And um, uh, we're open, uh, you know, whenever we start having peaches and we have people come into the pick your own stand, they pick their own peaches and then here and at the, uh, the South Buncombe location. Many fruit and vegetable growers used to hire migrant workers, Hispanic families who would come to the U.S. early in the spring and would work their way up the East Coast picking produce from state to state as it came into season. People don't move around anymore. They've set down roots. They've had families. The actual thought of having people pick up and move and move their families, that died 15, 20 years ago, unfortunately, but yet we still have our entrenched thoughts of the way the past was. Current situation is simply this. We don't have people moving around taking these jobs, so we have to be able to bring in guest workers to do these. Stay tuned, because when South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture continues, we'll introduce you to more family farmers and talk about how they manage labor on their farms. Years ago, when my Aunt Joan suffered a stroke, it was devastating for all of us. And although it didn't take her life, it took something so much more important to her. It took her independence. I don't ever want another family to have to go through that. 
The thing is, with what we can do today, a stroke doesn't have to happen. 80% of strokes can be prevented when the risk is detected early and then treated by a doctor. That's why many doctors recommend lifeline screening. We use sonograms to look inside your arteries because that's where the plaque that causes most strokes builds up. You usually can't see it or feel it, and a routine physical won't usually check for it. To schedule a lifeline screening near you, call 888-787-2873. We screen the carotid arteries, the abdominal aorta, and the peripheral arteries. It's easy, completely painless, and every screening is reviewed by a board-certified physician. Lifeline Screening offers packages of tests for $145. Call 888-787-2873. If a screening could prevent a stroke, why wouldn't you do it? Hello and welcome back to South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. So far we've met two peach operators in South Carolina, one with a large national operation, another with a small U-Pick and roadside market operation. But both of those rely on the government's H-2A program to hire enough laborers to harvest their crop. Now, let's travel down near South Carolina's coast, north of Charleston, and meet Peyton Parsons, president of Parsons Nursery in Georgetown. His nursery used the government's H-2A program a number of years ago, but found the program to be too expensive and cumbersome. The wholesale ornamental horticulture business also took a dive several years ago when the housing industry collapsed. So there hasn't been as high a demand for workers as there was a decade ago. Now, instead of relying on foreign nationals to do the work around the nursery, Peyton has grown a solid base of local workers. Most of our workforce uh, right now has been with us for quite some time, uh, 10 to 20 years. And so when we get uh, good folks in, we spend a lot of time and effort in uh, training them and teaching them the skills, the specialty sort of skills required for growing ornamental plants. Um, yeah, we want, we want to hold on to those folks. We want to keep them. And, um, and, and we, we do a pretty good job of that. We have a very low turnover. Um, but, but, but we know that uh, here in the next couple of years, when we start expanding production again, uh, we're gonna be out looking to expand our workforce and we know there's gonna be challenges because we've been there before. Parsons says plant nursery work isn't for everyone. They raise about 600 different plant varieties, each requiring unique lighting, watering, fertilizing, labeling, and shipping routines. So some of the jobs here is really sort of an apprenticeship type type of a situation where we'll bring in somebody, you know, young or, or otherwise uh, unskilled or low skill and uh, pair them up with somebody who, does, who is experienced and knows the job and, and they learn it over time. We have needs for a wide range of, uh, of skills from, from, from very low skilled folks that we can teach to you know, pot plants or pruning or, or uh, moving plants and that kind of stuff. Um, right on up to you know, uh, folks with uh, associate's degrees in horticulture or, or four-year degrees in, hort in horticulture. Let's travel back to the upstate of South Carolina and meet a woman who is fairly new to farming. In a short period of time, George Ann Webb has made a name for herself as a leader in the Charlet beef cattle industry in the southeast. Till 2004, all I knew was a cow went moo. And I didn't know anything about cows. But after her father-in-law died and she stayed home to care for her mother-in-law, she says tending to the cattle became therapy. Since then, George Ann and her husband David pretty much work their herd by themselves. Well, most of the time with the cattle, it's just David and I and then my son will pitch in. I, I work my cattle pretty hard to where they know me. They, you know, I can, I had one man call me and he said, where you been? I said, out in the pasture. And he said, I was here by myself. And I said, he said, well, what were you doing? I said, I was putting fly spray on my cows. He said, you do that out in the pasture? I said, yes, I do. Yeah. How about that bull? I said, I just walk up to him and put it on him. You know, it's a daily routine with them and they know I'm not there to do <laughs> cattle or creatures of habit. And if I keep them in a habit, we can work them pretty easy. If I'm gonna spend my money on this, I won't know everything about it. So I went Cow College One, Cow College Two at Clemson. I joined Pickens County Cattlemen's Association. I joined everything, South Carolina Cattlemen's, everything. And really, 
called and asked a lot of questions, found out what I was doing, tried to understand EPDs, tried to understand the genetics. Ms. Georgian also knows the importance of networking. She uses her organizational connections to the best advantage of the farm. She's an area director with the International Charlet Association. She's on the local cattlemen's board, and she's active in Farm Bureau, always willing to lend a hand to others and not too proud to ask for help when her farm needs it. It's all in networking. That's why I encourage everybody with cattle, join your Farm Bureau, join your county cattlemen's, join your state cattlemen's, join the NCBA. If you've got purebred, join your purebred association, be it Simmental, Angus, Hereford, whatever. Because the more people you know that are in the same business, you can get, you can get help that know what they're doing. When the Webb Farm needs outside help, they are quick to call fellow association members, local FFA high school students, or ag majors from nearby Clemson University. When I find good guys that'll help, I pretty much stick with them. From the Webb's Pickens County Farm, let's journey north and east a short drive to visit with Mr. Billy Ledford of beautiful Beechwood Farm, situated along the banks of the North Saluda River along the gateway to the Blue Ridge Mountains. The 300 to 400 acre farm sits in the fertile river valley and is prime for growing a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. Times have changed and the Ledfords have had to transition from one labor source to another. Our old time beautiful system has pretty much left us is people that are in between jobs, housewives, and local children would come and help us. But now it's more the, uh, more we move more into the uh, 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 local men, uh, people who follow the trade professionally from Florida up to here. So we're using mo most people to do that. Our economy has improved our standard of living for the local worker and they, they would not go in the fields. Also the competition with the, with the huge numbers of, uh, of uh, H-2A workers and also the, uh, the, the immigrant. So that's the, one of the main things that changed. And they, they are, they are, they are uh, very productive people, work very hard. You saw some there which you had the picture of them. And they work on our farm. They come rain or shine, if necessary, seven days a week. They start at daylight in the morning. And, and that's the big thing that changed is the, 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 my, the, the uh, available of that worker. We are in pretty good shape with help. We're established, we've been here uh, 50 years and so so we don't have we don't have much much issue we pretty good shape with help. One reason Beechwood Farm has such a steady workforce is because of the attitude Mr. Billy and his wife Beth have about their farm workers. They respect them and appreciate them. We encourage our helpers to help your family anytime they need you and we're here to support you and your effort to help your family. So we don't want them to. We don't want them to come to work if their family needs them, and so we. I, pre, I advocate that strongly. Stay tuned as South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture continues. When we come back, we'll introduce you to another family farmer and tell you about her diversified operation. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. We're taking a tour across South Carolina today and introducing you to family farmers, talking about their operations, how they manage those, and where they find labor to work their farms. Our last stop today is in Spartanburg County, near the intersection of Interstates 85 and 26, Baloo Farms in Boiling Springs. Like so many other South Carolina farms, Baloo Farms uses sustainable farming methods that minimize the impact on the environment, animals, and people. We stopped by the farm's market to talk with Harriet Baloo about her family's operation. It's a value to me to be able to um, supply them with something that is fresh and right off the tree because the, the taste and the nutrients are uh, available at that time when they're not so much so when it's grown somewhere else and trucked in. Um, so 
it's, it's good to get it local and to know who's growing it and know your farmer, know their values, and we hope that we can translate that into what we grow um, as well. While she admits it's tough work, Baloo Farms has built a sturdy base of farm workers who have become like family to them. Most of their laborers have been with them 10 years or more, some working on the farm for 30 years. Their families have grown up with us. They've become a part of our family. Um, we share holidays together and celebrations, life celebrations together when kids are being born and people are getting married. So it's all a part of the family. So they enjoy what they do or they wouldn't be here. They love working outdoors and that's usually why they choose a farm and then they like to stay with it and we appreciate it because then we are not training over and over again and we know them and they know us and it works well together when you can keep people for a long time. Well by now I hope you have a better understanding of who some of South Carolina's family farmers are, their operations and the challenges they face. Farm Bureau continues to work hard to seek some type of national immigration reform that's meaningful to provide farmers laborers year-round on their farms. It's already been proven that American citizens don't want to work agricultural jobs. Chow Carr puts it this way. Your fruit is going to be harvested one way or the other by a foreign national. So what you have to make a decision is do you want it harvested here in this country with our food safety regulations and our FDA governing how we grow our crops versus having that foreign national harvest them in another country where you don't have the same food safety protocols. That is not rhetoric, that is truthful. That's definitely something to think about. Before we leave you this half hour, we want to share with you some of the beautiful sights and sounds of South Carolina agriculture. Here's our Palmetto portrait. Well, that's about all the time we have for South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn about previous episodes we've aired, log on to our website, scfb.org. Click on video in the upper right-hand corner and then follow the link to the archives section. We'd also invite you to join us on Facebook, follow us on Pinterest, and if you have details or information you want to share with us, send us an email at voices at scfb.org. Until next time, I'm your host, Reggie Hall.